My wife and I got here yesterday afternoon. We enjoyed the company of Gary and Christina and a whole bunch of other people at Boots and Bling last night. Besides great five-finger barbecue, which was delicious, we had a wonderful time. And, and I just really want to commend you for the work you're doing here at St. Mark's School. It is, I understand, the second oldest school institution of education in Brevard County. And that's an extraordinary legacy, as people know. I'm a huge supporter of parochial education. I believe that there are creative opportunities for training and working with kids in a way that actually develops spiritual, intellectual, emotional, physical, in a way that actually crafts leaders for the future. And if there is anything that our culture needs right now is well-formed leaders. Not leaders who are interested in doing what, was, what is expedient, but leaders who lead well out of a real sense of integrity and character. And that is the opportunity that much of what happens in private education can afford. So I, I want to commend you for doing this. There are plenty of churches where private schools went by the board a long time ago. So you are to be commended not only for what you're doing now, but the investment that you continue to make in the life of these children is all but irreplaceable. So thank you very, very much for the work that you're doing here in what I consider to be critically important work, not only for our kids, but for the society in which we live. We live in an, a realm where uh, people are often mistreated by institutions. And that's really the story of what's going on with the man who was born blind. There is such a thing. We prayed at the beginning of the service, our collect. We prayed, Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread, notice true, that gives life to the world. Give us this bread, we pray. There is such a thing as false bread. Institutions that care more about, or religious institutions, that keeping rules and keeping up appearances than actually having a relationship with this one Jesus Christ who is so full of life and love and vitality, uh, who cares for everyone equally regardless of their status. And this certainly is shown in the story this morning. The man born blind is the least likely of someone to have an encounter with the visible Son of God. Uh, if Jesus was just interested in hanging out with the influential to try to make a difference in the institution, he would not have hung out with this man who was born blind. It is a provocative but important question when the story, they meet him and, Jesus, and his disciples ask, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Because you see, the, the folk era knowledge was that if you were born with some kind of congenital birth defect, it obviously was because of a curse pattern that was operating in your family. And that because the parents had done evil things, judgment was visited on those children in the form of these birth defects. I know it's ridiculous, but that's what they believed. And it wasn't new. Way back at the time of Jeremiah the prophet, several hundred years earlier, Jeremiah trying to correct the same thinking says, I know it is said, and this is their parabolic language, the father has eaten sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. And he said, no longer should that be said. But instead, everyone should be responsible for his own sins. A very provocative thing for Jeremiah to have said in his era. We're still wrestling even to this day with the relationship between corporate and individual responsibility. But in this case, who bore the brunt of these false judgments and this superstitious folklore was this man born blind who was assumed to have been cursed by God for what had happened in the life of his family. And Jesus says, you're asking the wrong question. And he goes to the man and he, do, he does something that any Jew watching would know exactly what he was doing in the sense that he takes dirt, puts a little spittle in it, creates in essence mud, puts it on the man's eyes. Now I said not knowing, knowing what he was doing, not because they'd seen it done, but what would echo in their head 
is Genesis, where the Lord forms humanity, man and woman, man out of the dust of the ground. In other words, what we're seeing is literally the actions of Jesus as creator God incarnate, again, through the medium of dust, that through which comes his great power that, in fact, changes the congenital birth defect so that the man can visibly see in a way that shocks everyone. It, it's true, there's no record in the Old Testament at all of anyone being supernaturally healed of blindness from birth. No wonder when people would run into him and say, isn't that the beggar who was born blind? And they'd have to say, no, it just, just looks like him. Because they'd never seen anything like that before. It was a small town. They knew each other. They all knew the stories. And they knew who his parents were. But this did not fit with what they had known in the past. You see, what they had known was false bread, not true bread. I have extraordinary sympathy with this story because I meet people all the time who have an interest in Jesus, but at the same time have not been treated well by the church. They've been mistreated by the institution. And it rings with me because in some ways that's my story. I grew up in a church system that really did say what was important was appearance and rule keeping. And that was actually more important than anything else. Well, you know what that fosters? It fosters a mistrust in relationships because maybe you're not as good as you say you are. Or in a kind of inner competitiveness and a desire to sort of bring in the influential because that helps us get ahead because those are the kinds of scenarios, the gossip that goes along with it, the superficial level of relationships, even if you families have known each other all of their lives, that's what the lack of security that being in a rule-keeping system produces. And inevitably, there are losers, people who don't live up, people who for some reason can't live up, people who don't fit the profile of who that local church actually wants and is looking for so that by the time I graduated from high school, I said, oh, thank God I don't have to go to church anymore. I know God was laughing too. But at that point, I wanted nothing to do with the institution. You see, it wasn't that I didn't believe somehow that Jesus was the Son of God, but that knowledge was so clouded by my experience of church I, to use the cliche, I couldn't see the forest for the trees. It wasn't actually until later that I actually met people who had about them a kind of winsomeness, a kind of joy that came from just the depths inside of them. I, I could see the light in their eyes, and I knew that they knew something about God and Christ that I didn't know at all, even though I had been raised in church. And through all of that, I wound up coming into my own relationship with Christ that had the same kind of life-changing vitality. But I still was caught up in this rule-keeping. And one time, in seminary, by the way, I should have known better by then, but I didn't, that a friend of mine and I were praying together, and he got this picture, a picture that, frankly, I thought was prophetic. He said, you know what I, what I pr see when I pray for you, Greg? He said, I see you, and it's like you're on a tightrope. And, you know, I got the circus analogy, way up there, balance beam, somehow, courageously, with great effort, trying to get from this point across to the other side, really steep and scary underneath. What is, was I going to make it or not? I certainly hope so. And when he said that, I thought, you know, even though I do believe in Jesus in a way that I hadn't in the past, that's actually still how I see a part of my life. And I realized in that moment that what I had done, this might be a little difficult to follow, I, I in essence, split the Trinity. Jesus was my friend, my Savior. God, well, that's a whole different story. He's still the one up there making a list and checking it twice. And I had to come face to face with the fact that who my heart related to, regardless of what I knew up here, was that God, not this God. 
the God that's expressed in the scriptures. Not to put, too, not to put a too fine a point on it, that's actually idolatry. In the sense that if who I am relating to as deity is not the God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, I'm actually relating to a false God. And I had to say to the Lord, okay, I want to know who you really are. Not this thing to which I'm trying to relate. But Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, Jesus' identification as the second person of the Trinity with God the Father is complete. He is, Paul writes in Colossians, the exact likeness of the invisible God. In other words, there's no, to use our language, there's no daylight between who God the Father is and who Jesus Christ is. And so if your picture of, Jesus, of God doesn't match up with what you see of Jesus in the New Testament, then your concept of God is not right. At least if Jesus who he sa- is who he says he is. I mean, it's completely consistent in that way. And I realized that who I related to and who I saw in Jesus were not the same. And I went on a kind of quest to say, God, I want to know who you really are. And I knew that that quest would be answered because that's what this story tells. Notice at the very beginning, who seeks out this blind beggar? The blind beggar, we don't know, is seeking, but Jesus seeks him. He picks him out. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. This is Psalm 23 personified. The good shepherd coming to this very broken one. Who, does it, who thinks he is in a place of demonic captivity for which there is no release. And Jesus breaks into the middle of that, literally does a new creation on his eyes, and changes the man. But there's price to pay. The religious system that lived into the mythology that put that man in that psychological prison to begin with still had to maintain their place of authority. And the man who stood complete and whole was in himself a denial and a challenge to that very broken system. So they had to get rid of him. That's why they put him out, excommunicated him from the synagogue. Systems that are built in rule keeping cannot stand someone who will challenge it. And they will do all that they can to protect their system even if it's wrong and consider expendable those who challenge it. And that's what happened to the man. And notice the, Jews, the good shepherd comes right back. He hears that he had been put out of the synagogue and invites him, in fact, into a deeper relationship. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Oh, tell me that I may believe in him, the man answers. And Jesus says, and I believe so tenderly, The one who is speaking to you is he. And the man, literally in the Greek, says he fell down with his face to the ground and worshipped him. Today, people are being presented in baptism and confirmation and reception. What they are saying by those actions is, I'm getting to know the real Jesus. And I love it. And I hope as we go through the service, as we go through the promises that are made, for those of you baptized and confirmed, it will be repetition. But I hope there is with inside of you something that rises up and says yes, and says, I want to know this one who made the blind see, who reached out to the outcast, and who brought new life to a man who was the least likely person to actually do anything. And yet, it is his story that we still tell, not the story of the insiders. Is there a gap in your life between what you think about God and what you see in Jesus? Is there a longing in you, to put it in a more positive way, for something more than that which you already know? So that what is in your life that is that kind of freedom, 
that kind of vitality. And so that you can say, by experience, I know the Lord to be my shepherd. He has protected me in the valley of the shadow of death. He stands beside me when others will forsake me. I know the companionship of his presence in good times and in bad. And even when I feel nothing experientially, I know because of the promises that the scripture gives that his word is faithful and that I will walk with him no matter what. Because his commitment to me is not based on what I feel. It's actually based on his work because he's the one seeking me even even when I want to go somewhere else. Even when I want to be the sheep that strays. Even though it might take me into the hands of the wolf. He is still there. This is the one into whom these people are saying yes. To give them life. Freedom. And the capacity to live courageously. With great winsomeness and dignity. Knowing whose they are children of the most high God who will judge systems and re redeem the broken every single time. So today, we will be welcoming new people into this family. May God help us to live up to the promises that we make so that what will not be said of St. Mark's is, you know, there are a bunch of rule keepers over there and I don't know a lot of joy in that fellowship. That's what draws people to other churches, is the absence of that kind of tenderness and the absence of that kind of joy that we find in Christ alone. Your symbol is the lion, which I think is magnificent. Lions are courageous. Lions are tender with their own. Lions fight on behalf of those in their pride who are wounded. May that be said of St. Mark's Church, following the good shepherd who lays down his life for even the least of his sheep. Amen.